Welcome back, everyone, to part two of Napoleon in Egypt from Extra History. If you did not see part one uh, of my reaction, the link is in the description, and I've also put the link there for part two. I would encourage you to go now and watch the entire series uh, on Napoleon in Egypt from Extra History, and then come back and start watching my reactions. Uh, this is part two. Uh, if you are a patron or a member, part three will be made available on the day that part two goes live to the general public. Uh, many of you may be watching this already, so you still have to wait a day in that case. But let's go ahead and dive into part two. Battle of the Pyramids. Nile River, Ooh, July 7th, 1798. The mood of the officers has turned. They've been in the desert for a week. Their men are exhausted, and some think Napoleon has finally gone too far. General Mirar is the most blunt. Napoleon has mismanaged this expedition, he says. The troops are going mad and dying of thirst. This operation was hasty and poorly planned. The British fleet could trap them here at any minute. They should withdraw, secure the Mediterranean, then return under better conditions. Others nod. Mirar's words carry weight. At 28, he's young, the same age as Napoleon, but he's also a hero of the revolution. The first man to lead troops in singing the revolutionary anthem, La Marseillaise. Yet Napoleon coldly shuts him down. And this is one of those moments, right, where you could just as easily have ended up in a situation where Napoleon gets overthrown by his men. And that's really the last we ever hear of Napoleon Bonaparte. He's just one more French general in a long list of French generals that really didn't accomplish a whole lot over a long career. He's 28 years old. He's not an emperor yet. He hasn't conquered the world. He's won some nice victories in France and in Italy and places like that. But... Uh, so have some other people. So uh, this is a turning point. This is a moment when Napoleon's career could have been completely derailed. They will continue to Cairo. General Murar, however, takes a different route. The morning after the showdown, Murar, knowing his career is over and the expedition doomed, mm. rides into the desert and shoots himself. Yet another soldier lost to Napoleon's ambition. Wow. Thanks so much to Trade Coffee for keeping us history-loving beans caffeinated. One week before, it's July 1st, and Napoleon's invasion of Egypt is so far a total success. He's crossed the Mediterranean, eluded the British fleet, and taken Alexandria. On the way, he'd even forced the Knights of Malta to capitulate, plundering their treasure to fund his campaign. But there is one little fly in the ointment, specifically a British fly by the name of Admiral Horatio Nelson. See, upon arriving in Alexandria, Napoleon found out exactly how close he'd been to getting caught by the British, as a Royal Navy vessel had been in Alexandria only 24 hours mm. before the French arrived. That meant that the British would find them here soon enough, so he began drawing up his fleet to defend Alexandria against this inevitable naval attack, lest they be defeated at sea and stranded in Egypt. Then, And the Navy, the British Navy, is, you could argue, ultimately going to be... Napoleon's downfall, because the British Navy is going to lead to the blockade of trade with France, which is going to lead to Napoleon making decisions that eventually lead him to his invasion of Russia uh, and eventually lead to his downfall. Uh, if Britain hadn't been separated by the English Channel, maybe he knocks them out of the war too, but it's that Navy and it's that same British Navy that's going to be the downfall of the Germans in World War I. It's something that Britain has always relied on and it has always been kind of their ace in the hole, so to speak. It's the one thing that many of these continental powers haven't been able to overcome. With his naval situation definitely very secure, he prepared Egypt for his rule. See, Napoleon knew that if he hoped to turn Egypt into a colony, he needed local support. That's why, when his men had looted the Vatican archives during the Italian campaign, they'd captured a very specific prize, the only Arabic-language printing press in existence. Hmm. Soon, he was churning out propaganda leaflets in French, Arabic, Turkish, and Greek. People of Egypt, began one proclamation, you will be told by our enemies that I have come to destroy your religion. Believe them not! Tell them that I am come to restore your rights, punish your usurpers, and raise the true worship of Mohammed. It was a pretty normal opening for one of these. And you know, to be honest, there are so many that we can't quote them all verbatim here. But here are some of the big points that Napoleon reiterated. One, that the Mameluk sultans, a foreign minority, were the oppressors of Egypt. 
Two, that Napoleon had come to liberate the Egyptians and restore their natural rights. Three, that he was a friend to Islam, having defeated both the Pope and the Knights of Malta. Four, that no Egyptian had any reason to fear, unless... And this is all, we mentioned this a little bit in the first episode, this is all really important because when you're trying to conquer a power that's far away from your home, uh, and you know that long term you're not going to be able to keep a huge standing army there, you've got to win them to your side. Uh, the hearts and minds thing that we still hear today. Uh, and so Napoleon is kind of ahead of the game compared to a lot. And, you know, the Romans did some of this, too. And I'm sure Napoleon's learning this from the Romans, right? The Romans did a pretty good job of balancing, conquering people with assimilating them into the Roman Empire uh, and kind of allowing them, you know, look at uh, the New Testament, for example. Uh, you have the Jews still being able to worship the way that they want to, still having their religious leaders in place, even kind of nominally having a king in Herod uh, who is Jewish. Uh, so that's the kind of thing Napoleon's trying to do here. They resisted, in which case they would, five, be mercilessly slaughtered. These proclamations were weird. On one hand, Napoleon had correctly identified the political and ethnic fault lines between native Egyptians and the Mamelukes. The so, and, and then again, I don't, I'm not often too critical of extra history because I feel like they gener generally get it right and they do a good job of presenting this stuff. But it just feels like they're trying really, really hard in this series to convince us about how weird some of this stuff is that Napoleon's doing when it's really not. This is exactly what you should be trying to do if you're in Napoleon's position. Now, we can judge it and we can say, okay, well, he was being misleading and he had ulterior motives and all of that kind of stuff. But what else should he do in this situation? If he's going to try to conquer these people, he's doing exactly the right thing. I don't mean it's right. I mean it's the right thing in his mind to accomplish that. The joint Mameluke rulers, Murad Bey and Ibrahim Bey, were deeply unpopular. And there was definitely room to pursue a divide-and-conquer strategy. But his attempts to claim the secular deism of the French Revolution was compatible with Islam just because they were both strictly monotheist were unconvincing at best. On top of that, these messages were also confusing. He used revolutionary buzzwords like liberty and natural rights that were unfamiliar mm. to most Egyptians and had no Arabic equivalent. And the translations themselves were also just atrocious. Largely <laughs> so that's a great point is that it's not enough just to translate a language. The language doesn't necessarily translate the same because the culture's different, the understanding's different. So for example, if I were to go to people in certain cultures and talking and talk about having um God in my heart or asking Jesus into my heart, which is a phrase that many Christians use. In some cultures, you would actually want to say asking Jesus into your stomach because they use stomach the same way we use heart when describing kind of the core of who you are. Uh, so those are the kinds of nuances that can get lost in a translation that something that makes perfect sense to us, even if you get the language right, doesn't necessarily make sense to them. Written by a French linguist, with help from Maltese translators who spoke an unusual Arabic dialect, they contained basic grammatical errors, with one message so garbled that it inadvertently claimed that the French were Muslims. With these messages, Napoleon aimed to get Egyptian religious leaders on his side, thinking that they would be key to holding Egypt once he defeated the base. However, his clumsy proclamations were instead mocked by the very Islamic scholars mm. he so hoped to impress. Alexandrians, too, seemed to be against him. After the army fanned out to find accommodations, several soldiers turned up with their throats slit. On the Oops. edge of town, Bedouins also kidnapped several officers and held them for ransom. And in response, Napoleon sent his Afro-Caribbean general Thomas Alexandre Dumas to handle the negotiations for their return. Send the guy that looks the most like them. I don't know if that had anything to do with it at all. It might just be that Dumas was the guy he trusted the most. I don't know. But they couldn't lose time. They really needed to press on. With the threat of the British fleet at their backs, they must secure their position and seize Cairo immediately. The plan was for a naval flotilla to enter the Nile while Napoleon's army of the Orient marched inland across the desert before cutting east to seize river ports and meet the flotilla. Then all would move south along the river to Cairo. Good plan? Sure. 
Except, well, this was Egypt in July. The French wore heavy wool uniforms. This is like attacking Russia in the winter. That's basically the equivalent of this. Adorned with black leather and metal that heated quickly in the sun. They had no canteens or water wagons, and each carried a 40-pound pack plus a musket. Not to mention cavalrymen often had to carry their saddles, since Napoleon had incorrectly assumed that he could just acquire hundreds of horses in Egypt. The initial march inland took three days. Men collapsed and died from dehydration. And when they came across village wells, they lost all discipline and scrambled for water until it was drunk dry. And dozens of men, desperate from thirst, took their own lives. Mm. A dark joke circulated. Before attacking Alexandria, Napoleon had promised that each man would receive six acres of land after this campaign. Voila, they would say, gesturing at the barren desert, our six acres. Meanwhile, Bedouin stalked the marching column, harrying and killing any stragglers. They even snatched soldiers and executed them within view of their comrades, just out of musket range. Can you imagine the psychological impact of that? You're already in a desperate situation. You're, you're hot, you're thirsty, and seeing guys executed just out of range, uh, knowing that that could be you and that was one of your buddies that was just with you. I mean, the, the psychological terror happening here. And, and then knowing that you've still got to fight battles and you've got to deal with the, uh, the British Navy. Uh, foreshadowing of the retreat from Russia a little bit here. Even after reaching the Nile, things definitely got no better. Upon reaching it, soldiers crowed in victory and threw themselves into the waters, splashing and drinking, until crocodiles ambushed and dragged several into the river. Men who dumped rations to lighten their packs during the march died of exhaustion and hunger. A local disease broke out, blinding anyone infected. Most Egyptian villagers abandoned their homes ahead of the army, meaning they took all their food but the watermelons growing in their gardens, and if any remaining resisted them taking food, the French simply torched their village. Which one could imagine prompted what happened next. Not exactly the best way to win the hearts and minds of the people to torch people's villages as you come through. One day, a woman approached a French officer carrying a baby. But when she got close, she drew a pair of shears and gouged out his eyes. It was then that Napoleon's generals began to whisper about the expedition. Several officers, gathering in General Dumas' tent to sample watermelon, began to openly voice doubts about the mission. See, while these men had known that Napoleon was ambitious, they'd fought under him in Italy after all, they were now starting to realize a fundamental truth. Napoleon Bonaparte was willing to sacrifice anyone to take any number of casualties for his own advancement. So that's the, the trouble sometimes with uh, very talented, very... Um, ambitious people is, and we've talked about this before with Julius Caesar. We've talked about it in, in the context of Napoleon before. You could say the same thing about the Germans uh, in World War II. Uh, when you're that ambitious, the kind of ambitious that leads you to do these extraordinary things, you tend not to have an off switch to that. You tend not to know when you've gone too far because when you've been successful so far, you think you can do anything. Even to an extent, Robert E. Lee in the, sec in the Civil War, right? He wins some great victories, so then he marches north and ends up with Pickett's Charge, which was certainly an ill-advised and poor, poorly executed attempt to break the Union lines. But when you're that ambitious and when you've been successful with long odds before, you start to think you can do anything. And I think that we see glimpses of that here with Napoleon uh, going too far, uh, not recognizing the limits that should be placed on what you're doing. It was the attitude that would cause one of his commanders to later nickname him the 10,000 men a month general. The Army of the Orient had nearly had enough when they ran into the Mameluke forces coming the other way. The result was a confused battle on both land and river, with Napoleon forming the army into squares to resist the Mameluke cavalry charges. Meanwhile, the Mameluke flotilla boarded and captured three French ships before a lucky shot exploded the enemy flagship's magazine and caused them to retreat. But the armies would meet again. July 20th, 1798, near Cairo. They will call it the Battle of the Pyramids. Can you imagine that this battle happened in the middle of July in Egypt? 
And though in later paintings these structures will loom over the action, in reality they are nine miles distant, barely seen on the horizon. Ottoman and Mameluke cavalry bear down on the French. Trained from childhood in martial arts and horsemanship, each one is a consummate warrior. Their gilded armor gleams, and armed servants follow them to hand them appropriate weapons. The French are impressed, even awed by the sight. Still, they give no quarter. Fire! An officer yells, and cannons blast out canister shot, throwing cones of lead balls into the horsemen. French infantry, arranged into giant squares, so their bayonets make a hedge of blades, jet smoke with each volley. Now so, kind of think of your three branches of the military, your infantry, artillery, and cavalry. You could almost think of it as like a rock, paper, scissors game, right? Um, forming squares is how the infantry can defeat cavalry, but it makes you vulnerable to artillery. Where, Well, if the Mamelukes don't have a lot of artillery, then you're perfectly safe in forming square. But forming square means that your guys are several rows deep and like even a solid shot of artillery could just mow through multiple guys. But it's great against cavalry. Uh, cavalry then can run down your artillery uh, and your infantry can take out the artillery if it gets close enough, but uh, is vulnerable to cavalry if they're not in square. So there's always a way of kind of one-upping the other side but forming squares is perfect against an artillery or a cavalry force that doesn't have large numbers of artillery. Now, the Mamelukes are proud warriors. They seized power from Saladin's dynasty and even defeated the Mongols, but they have never seen modern artillery or anti-cavalry tactics. The Mameluk horses scream and turn aside, terrified by the bursting artillery shells. Those that do reach the French wheel away, unable to find an opening to charge and shying away from the wounding blades. Even firing into the French ranks does nothing, with wounded men pulled into the center of the squares and quickly replaced. Then, the horsemen try to rush between two squares to get behind, but it only puts them into a crossfire. 10,000 Mamelukes die by the River Nile, killing less than 300 French wow. invaders. For days, French soldiers will drag bodies out of the water to loot for coins and treasure. In so this is a a big morale boost for Napoleon's army, right? It's been a pretty bad few days for them, few weeks. Uh, things have not gone well, but now they're at the Nile River. There's fresh water. They've won a great victory with comparatively few casualties. Now they're going to be able to loot and do all the things that armies do. It's looking up for them, at least for now. Uh, but, of course, we always we know there's always more to the story. So that will be uh, for part three tomorrow. As always, thank you for watching. Definitely go check out the rest of their series. Watch it all before you come back and watch these reactions. Thanks for watching.